Hello, everyone. Today, Michelle and I will give an introduction and update to Kubernetes Six Storage. My name is Xinyang. I work at VMware in the cloud storage team. I'm also a co-chair in Six Storage along with Sadali from Google. Hi, my name is Michelle. Um, I work at Google and uh, me along with Jan from Red Hat are tech leads for Six Storage. Our session today will include two parts. In the first half, we'll give an introduction. In the second half, we will give an update and a deep dive. In the introduction part, I'm going to talk about some basic concepts in Kubernetes storage and how to get involved. Kubernetes storage provides a way for containers in the pods to consume block or file storage. Persistent storage is one type of storage that live beyond a pod's life cycle. The terminologies we heard most in SIG storage are probably PVC, PV, and storage class. PVC, persistent volume claim, is a user space object. It is a request by a user for storage. A PV, persistent volume, is a cluster scope object. It represents a physical volume on the storage system. A PVC and a PV have a one-to-one -one, one mapping. Storage class is in the cluster scope. It's a way for admin to describe the classes of storage. Different classes might map to different quality of service levels or other admin defined policies. In dynamic provisioning, storage class is used to find out which provisioner should be used and what parameters should be passed to the provisioner when creating the volume. A pod is a group of one or more containers with a shared storage and network resources and the specification for how to run the containers. A pod is a user space object. A PVC is used by a pod. In static provisioning, a cluster admin creates a number of PVs which carry the details of the real storage. The control plane can bind PVCs to PVs in a cluster. However, if you want a PVC to bind to a specific PV, you will need to pre-bind them. When none of the static PVC, uh, when none of the static PVs the admin, the administrator created match a user's PVC, the cluster may try to dynamically provision a volume specifically for that PVC. The provisioning is based on storage classes. The PVC must request a storage class and the admin must have created and configured that class for dynamic provisioning to occur. So here are examples of a pod, a PVC and storage class. The pod is using the PVC. PVC has capacity access modes. It's the read write ones here and the storage class name specified. And in the storage class, there is a provisioner that determines what volume plugin is used for provisioning PVs. The reclaim policy is retain here. That means the PV will remain along with the physical volume on the storage system when the user deletes the PVC. If the claim, if the reclaim policy is delete, the PV along with the physical volume will be deleted when the user deletes the PVC. And the allow volume expansion is true here, um, indicating that volume expansion can be requested by the user. And the volume binding mode um, can be either immediate or wait for first consumer. It is immediate in this example, indicating that a volume binding and dynamic provisioning occurs once the PVC is created, but this may result in unschedulable pods. Uh, so a cluster admin can address this issue by specifying the wait for first consumer mode, which will delay the binding and provisioning of PV until a pod using the PVC is created. Storage class also has 
parameters that are storage provider specific and opaque to the Kubernetes. And next I'm going to uh, talk about Fmore storage. Fmore storage becomes available when pod is started and goes away when pod goes down. So uh, here the uh, we include local Fmore storage that includes uh, uh, empty dir, secrets, config maps, and downward APIs. And uh, uh, we also have a uh, CSI Fmore volumes here. Um, and then um, there's also a generic admiral volumes, so I will go over them. Uh, empty dir volume is first created when a pod is assigned to a node and exists as long as the pod is running on that node. Uh, as the name su suggests, the empty dir volume is initially empty. All containers in a pod can read and write the same files in the empty dir volume, though that volume can be mounted at the same or different paths in each container. And when a pod is removed from a node for any reason, the data in the empty dir is deleted permanently. And empty dir volume can be used as a scratch space. A secret volume is used to pass sensitive information such as passwords to pods. You can store secrets in the secrets Kubernetes API and among them as files for use by pods. Secret volumes are backed by uh, tempfs, so they are never written to non-volatile storage. A config map provides a way to inject non-confidential configuration data into pods. When referencing a config map, you provide the name of the config map in the volume. In this example, the config map is mounted as a volume and all the contents are mounted into the pod at the path derived from the mount path and uh, the key in the config map. Uh, and then next I will talk about the downward APIs. So uh, here we can see an example of the downward API volume. It makes uh, downward API data available to the applications. It mounts a directory and writes the requested data in plain text file. And in this uh, YAML file, uh, you can see that the pod has a downward API volume and the container mounts the volume uh, at this uh, the uh, specified location. Um, and each element on the items is a downward API volume file. Um, so the first element specifies that the, the value of the pod's metadata uh, labels field should be stored in a file named labels. So, um, Next, I want to talk about um, the CSI inline ephemeral volume. Uh, so we set volume types to CSI in the pod uh, spec and specify the driver name and the volume attributes. And for a CSI driver to support CSI ephemeral volume, it must be modified or implemented specifically for this purpose. A CSI driver is suitable for CSI ephemeral inline volume if uh, it serves a special purpose and needs custom per volume parameters like drivers that provide secrets to a pod. Uh, so the secret store CSI driver is an example. A CSI driver is not suitable for CSI ephemeral inline volumes when provisioning is not local to the node or when more volume creation requires volume attributes that should be restricted to an admin, for example, uh, parameters in a storage class. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about generic more volume. Uh, this feature 
allows any uh, existing solid drivers that support dynamic provisioning to be used as an ephemeral volume with the volume slab cycle bound to your pod. It can be used to provide scratch storage that is different from the root disk, for example, uh, persistent memory or a separate local disk on that node. All storage class parameters for volume provisioning are supported. All features supported with PVCs are supported, such as uh, storage capacity tracking, snapshotting, cloning, uh, volume resizing. This feature um, is beta since 1.21 release, and it is targeting GA in 1.23. So that's all for the introduction of ephemeral volumes. So now I will talk about volume plugins. Kubernetes volume plugins include Intree plugins, AutoTree Flux volume, and CSI drivers. Some Intree plugins, such as those ephemeral ones that I mentioned earlier, will stay in tree. But the most of other Intree plugins are either deprecated or are migrating to CSI drivers. Michelle will talk more about that in detail later. Flex volume is deprecated. CSI driver is the recommended way to write plugins. The uh, Kubernetes implementation of the container storage interface CSI has been GA since the 1.13 release. Uh, CSI is uh, designed to be vendor neutral, interoperable, and has a focus on specification. It defines a set of uh, storage interfaces so that a storage vendor can write just one plugin and have it work across a, a range of container orchestration systems. In the CSS spec, we have RPCs for volume lifecycle management. This includes provisioning support such as create and delete volumes and RPCs uh, that make sure volumes are available for pod to use, such as attach and detach volume and mount and unmount volumes. And it also has other functions such as expand volume, uh, snapshotting, cloning, volume house, and so on. So here is an example uh, of a CSI deployment that shows various uh, Kubernetes components, the CSI driver and the storage system that is used to persist the data. Here we have the cube control manager on the master node. A CSI driver controller plugin is deployed together with Kubernetes the CSI external provisioner, external attacher, external resizer, and external snapshotter set cards. Note that CSI driver controller pod does not have to run on the same node as the Kubernetes master, but it's recommended to run on dedicated control plane nodes. The Kubernetes CSS set calls uh, watching Kubernetes API objects such as persistent volume claims, persistent volumes, uh, volume attachments, uh, volume snapshots to detect create volume, attach volume, volume expansion, volume snapshot requests. The set calls call the CSS driver, and the CSS driver communicates with the storage system to complete those volume operations. On Kubernetes worker nodes, we have Kubelet and the CSI driver node plugin deployed together with the node driver registrar sidecar container. Node driver registrar fetches driver information using the get info from a CSI endpoint and registers the CSI driver with Kubelet on that node. Kubelet uh, directly issues CSI node get info uh, node stage volume and node publish volume calls against CSI drivers to get info and mount volumes. So that's all for the basic Kubernetes storage concepts. Next, I will talk about how to get involved. So here uh, is the SIG storage community page. It has lots of information to get you started. We have bi-weekly meetings on Thursdays uh, where we go through features we are tracking for each Kubernetes release and discuss any design issues 
or other issues added to the agenda. This is a good place for a new contributor to get started, join the meeting, and see how the SIG works. What are you, what are you interested in? And uh, get assigned to work on some tasks. The communication within the SIG is through the mailing list or the Slack channel. I included some resources for your reference. Here are docs that explain um, what are the Kubernetes story concepts and what is CSI. The last reference is an example to deploy the sample CSI host, host pass driver. Um, for a new contributor who wants to contribute code, it's good to follow this example and learn how CSI works. So that's all for the introduction. Now I will hand it over to Michelle for the SIG storage update. Thank you, Xing. Um, so I'm going to give an update on some of the major projects and initiatives that the SIG has recently completed and is also actively working on. I'll start with a deep dive on two uh, major projects that we've been doing and then give an update on 122 uh, and what we're targeting for up the upcoming 123 release, and then go into some longer term projects that we're um, sort of investigating and designing. So let's uh, deep dive into the first project, which is CSI migration. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a sub area of the overall cloud provider extraction effort where the built in cloud providers are going to be removed from Kubernetes starting in 1.24. The overall effort has been ongoing for a couple of years now, and we're finally reaching a point of maturity where we're feeling confident in switching over to the external cloud provider model. Now, persistent volumes has some unique challenges compared to the rest of the cloud provider components. Um, the main challenge is that many of the original volume types are built directly into the core Kubernetes API. That imposes a very strict backwards compatibility requirement with this entry API. So we can't just remove the built-in volume plugins directly. Um, so what we've done instead is CSI migration. The CSI migration is a feature that lets you continue using the existing API for your existing persistent volumes and storage classes. But underneath the covers, it actually makes calls to a corresponding CSI driver instead of going through the built-in drivers. So right now, all of the major cloud provider plugins have beta support for CSI migration, including AWS EBS, Azure Disk and File, OpenStack Cinder, GCE PD, and vSphere volumes. And all of these plugins um, are expected to GA and uh, GA their CSI migration implementations starting uh, in 1.24. Uh, next slide. All right, so what do you need to do to turn on CSI migration? The answer depends on how you are provisioning your Kubernetes clusters. If you're using a managed Kubernetes distribution, then in most cases, you should expect that the distribution will take care of everything for you transparently but it is best to double check with your provider to, to make sure um, that is indeed the case. If you are managing your own Kubernetes clusters, then you will have to install the corresponding uh, CSI driver for your cloud and then enable the CSI migration feature gates in a, a very specific order, which is detailed in the link here. There's also a few caveats to watch out for. First, uh, despite 
using CSI underneath the covers, turning on CSI migration does not enable CSI only features um, for your volumes that are using the older APIs. Uh, CSI migration is meant to be able to provide backwards compatibility with the entry API, but it's not designed for future compatibility of uh, future CSI features. So if you need to use the newer features like CSI snapshots, then the best option is to actually re-import your persistent volumes directly using the CSI API. Another caveat is that some of the drivers may have some rare corner cases and behaviors that might not be supported by the CSI driver. Um, we expect these behaviors to be rare and not commonly used, so most people should not be impacted. Um, nevertheless, we have explicitly deprecated all of these behaviors that we're aware of. So please double check the Kubernetes release notes um, going all the way back to one Kubernetes 117 uh, and look for these deprecation notices for your cloud. Also because of this, it's important that you start trying out CSI migration in your non-production clusters um, so that we can catch any other behavioral differences that we might have missed as early as possible and, and we have more time to address um, those issues. So in summary, uh, CSI migration is coming up really fast uh, within the next half year or so. If you're using one of these internal cloud providers, uh, please help us out and start testing out uh, your workload and workflow compatibility with this feature. We have the CSI migration Slack channel uh, and we'll be there to help answer any questions that you might have and be able to help you out with any issues. All right, so, um, that is CSI migration. Uh, moving on to the next uh, feature deep dive is uh, CSI windows. So we GA'd CSI windows in the most recent 122 release. Um, what this feature is, is a way to be able to run CSI drivers on Windows nodes. One of the biggest challenges that we faced was uh, dealing with the lack of Windows pri privilege container support, which is something required by C most CSI drivers to be able to do privileged operations on the file system and the mount points. So to deal with this, we created a binary called CSI proxy. Uh, CSI proxy runs as a Windows service and it exposes a gRPC endpoint to CSI drivers for doing, C, uh, for doing privileged operations. Um, the current operations that CSI proxy currently supports include disk and volume operations, um, operations on the NTFS file system, and Samba or SIPS. Um, iSCSI support is also available in the alpha phase. Um, there's a number of CSI drivers that have implemented uh, CSI support on Windows, including AWS CBS, Azure Disk and File, GCE PD, and a generic Samba driver. So uh, if you're running on any of these platforms, please check this out. One thing to note, uh, in 1.22, there is also a new alpha feature uh, put out by SIG Windows that adds privileged container support. So, um, you know, once that graduates in maturity, then potentially we can remove uh, the need for a CSI proxy and having a separate service to do the privileged operations. However, uh, to retain backwards compatibility with existing CSI drivers, what we're planning on doing is to turn the CSI proxy gRPC client library into a normal 
low library uh, with using the same APIs. That way we can minimize the transition uh, between the CSF proxy model to making direct library calls and that should mitigate any um, major changes that you might have to make in your CSI driver to, to transition between the two uh, models. So if you're interested in the Windows work um, or if you have any further questions, uh, we have a CSI Windows Slack channel where you can uh, come in and ask any questions or get help on any issues may, you may have encountered. Um, so now I'm going to give a brief overview on some other projects in the SIG. There's a lot of efforts going on right now, so I won't be able to cover all of them today, but I'll highlight a few. First, in 1.22, we GA two major features, the CSI windows, which we just talked about, and the CSI service account token. This is an important security feature that enables CSI drivers to authenticate using the pod service account token. This allows CSI drivers to be able to support per pod authentication instead of broader shared credentials that many systems may require today. One example of a CSI driver using this feature is the secret store CSI driver, which lets you mount secrets from an external secret manager like Vault. If you're a CSI driver author, please take a look at this feature and see if it can help improve your security posture. So moving on to 1.23, there's a few features that we're going to target GA. And next slide, please. Thank you. The first two are related to FS group and volume ownership. The first enhancement improves scalability when mounting very large volumes that contain a lot of files. This feature adds a new option to the pod spec that tells Kubelet to skip the process that updates volume ownership. Before this change, we've seen instances where mounting a very large volume could take more than 30 minutes. But after this change, mounting a volume is back to a couple seconds. So please take a look at this feature if you're, ex if you're uh, experiencing slow mounts and you have very large volumes. The second FS group feature is for CSI driver authors. It lets CSI drivers explicitly opt in to support FS group instead of using a heuristic that was not accurate in a lot of cases. So if you're a CSI driver author, um, please take a look at this uh, FS group policy feature. The last feature that we're targeting for GA is generic ephemeral volumes. Shing talked about this earlier, so I won't go into a lot of details, but to summarize, um, this feature allows a pod to specify a volume template, which will dynamically provision and manage volumes with the same lifetime as your pod. Any existing volume type that supports PVCs today will be able to work with this feature. So go ahead and check this out. All right, and so moving on, now I will highlight a couple efforts that we're actively prototyping and designing right now, and where we could actually use a, a lot of help from the community. First up is non-graceful node shutdown. This effort is exploring ways that we can safely fence and detach volumes when a node is shut down and still ensure that we don't get into a split brain scenario. Um, this is in the design and prototyping phase. So um, if you have any ideas or you have work in this area that you think would be useful, um, please uh, uh, join us in these discussions and um, we would appreciate any ideas or um, help that you can provide. Another interesting initiative that we're starting is to explore is the volume snapshot namespace transfer. 
Um, this project is looking at ways to allow easily moving volume snapshot objects to another namespace. And potentially, depending on um, the ideas explored here, we could expand that to also look into ways to actually move volumes across namespaces as well. Another exciting area that we're starting. Um, uh, and next slide, please. We're also collaborating with uh, a couple other SIGs on a variety of other projects. Um, I'll highlight the container notifier effort. This is a feature that allows for sending custom signals to a pod and being able to define custom actions for that pod to take when processing that signal. This is the mechanism that we're exploring to be able to quiesce an application before taking a snapshot. So this is a, a key driver for being able to enable um, application consistent snapshots. Another interesting proposal that we're exploring with API machinery is Leans. This is offering the ability to essentially lock an object and prevent it from being accidentally deleted. Um, <clears throat> now you may think, uh, how is this different from finalizers? The main difference is that finalizers, um, their main goal is to ensure that all of the deletion handlers for an object are able to finish um, before the object is finally deleted from the API server. With finalizers, the big difference is once the deletion process starts, you can't reverse it and you can't undo a delete. With liens, the, uh, the biggest difference is that liens will prevent the deletion process from starting in the first place. So this will um, you know, help with the scenarios when you really want to protect some objects from being accidentally deleted. And so that's another exciting effort that um, we are working with uh, API machinery on. And we're hoping to be able to use this to uh, add some extra protection to uh, secrets, especially uh, in terms of in terms of um, protecting secrets that are used for volumes. All right, so uh, as you can see, there are a lot of different projects that we are working on in SIG storage. And we could you know, use help all over, all over in all of these efforts. So we always welcome new contributors. Um, if any of these projects sound interesting to you, please reach out to us through our Slack channel or join one of our SIG meetings uh, that we hold every two weeks. We'll welcome, um, we welcome new ideas and new, contributor, and new contributors and we'll um, you know, definitely try to help you uh, get involved into the SIG. So that concludes our presentation today. Thank you very much for watching and we look forward to seeing you in the SIG. Thank you.